Um, thank you everyone for joining us um, for our Pastured IBAC information webinar brought to you by North Coast Local Land Services. I would like to just start today uh, in saying that North Coast Local Land Services acknowledges the traditional custodians of all the nations on which we live, work and play. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here today. Alrighty, so I believe there's still a few people looking to try and log in, so I will um, proceed to make a bit of a start, but um, the picture you can see just on that first slide there is uh, from a property in the Tweed Valley taken uh, a few weeks ago. Um, that paddock there is uh, close on 100 odd acres, which is virtually now um, 70 to 80 percent uh, wiped out due to dieback. So, Today, a couple of the key things we're going to be uh, looking to cover off are all those common producer asked questions. Obviously, what is pasture dieback? A bit of history about dieback. Current state of dieback in New South Wales. How we identify pasture dieback. How fast can it spread? What are the main species we're seeing affected in New South Wales? We'll have a bit of a chat around um, the cause. Uh, nearly bugs, which are a, an insect pest, and a couple of others. Um, we'll look at how to minimise the spread and potentially how we'll manage dieback. And the big one that a lot of producers want to know is um, what am I going to do in trying to return to a tropical grass or, or other pasture base? Um, I will just also like to mention. Um, to any of our attendees today, um, there's a, a chat pod there. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please type them into the chat pod and um, people will be grabbing hold of those and moving them over. We will have question time at the end. Um, based on how this presentation is set up, hopefully um, we will look to cover all of the, all of your key questions. Um, however, please make sure that you pop them in that chat pod there. So what is dieback? Basically, it's a condition that kills our sown and native summer growing grasses or our C4 grasses. Um, I just wanted to really clear that up that um, you know we've had a few reports from people saying that um, they've got big bare areas on their property, um, meaning that they've lost you know legumes and herbs and other things like that. Um, however, pasture dieback doesn't affect our legumes and herbs or any of those broadleaf uh, species. Typically, uh, people have noticed you know, small patches um, anywhere from a few square metres in size through to potentially a couple of acres or hectares um, of discoloured, sick-looking tropical grass species. Um, and we'll talk about the key identifying factors a little bit further in. Um, Again, just reiterating that pasture dieback, um, even though it's a term pasture, it is the condition that's only affecting our tropical or summer growing grasses, both natives and sown species. The other thing with pasture dieback is it's not limited to the landscape or soil type, and we'll talk about this a little bit further um, in the presentation, but basically what we're saying there is we're seeing pasture dieback on the north coast across a range of soil types um, from flat areas to undulating right the way through to incredibly steep areas as well. So um, there's no real, I guess you could say, correlation with um, the soil type or, or landforms at this point in time. A little bit of history on pasture dieback, um, and I thought this was important just to make mention of um, given that a few producers are feeling like, you know, why is this a new thing or, or why is this happening now? Um, the condition occurs episodically. Um, there are several reports, if you look back in history, of dieback-like events in Queensland, um, some going back to near on over 100 odd years ago. Um, the most recent outbreaks of pasture dieback in Queensland, the 1990s, and the most recent in 2015. Um, in Queensland now, um, it's fairly well scattered along the higher rainfall or, or areas that tend to receive you know, more than 600 mils annually, um, anywhere from that Atherton Tablelands right down to southeast Queensland, then obviously uh, the far north coast of New South Wales. 
Now, the reason I thought it was just important to mention that is <clears throat> there have been a few producers, you know, wondering, you know, why, why is this happening now? And, you know, obviously the logical, how am I going to manage this? The key message there is, I suppose, it has been around before and producers have continued to farm rather successfully um, in and around the condition. The other thing I'd like to also highlight is just because you hear that pasture dieback is reported in a region doesn't mean it's everywhere. So what we're really saying with that is, you know, we've got pasture dieback now in the Tweed Valley, for example, on the far north coast of New South Wales. It doesn't necessarily mean that every single property or land holding is going to become affected and we'll talk about that a little bit further on today as well. In New South Wales, um, a little bit of history on how it's played out for us. Um, in 2019, we did have a few reports of you know grasses just looking a bit unwell. Um, however, given the, the drought conditions at the time, it was pretty hard to determine um, was it in fact pasture dieback or was it drought. So it was a little bit um, unclear through, throughout 2019, given the seasonal conditions. However, um, in talking to a few landholders in the Tweed Valley now, um, some have even said that, well, maybe um, it was actually there in 2019, but they weren't 100% sure. Um, but coming around to March 2020, that's where we, I guess we could say, a first officially confirmed pasture dieback on the far north coast of New South Wales, again in that Tweed Valley region. It followed um, some very good rainfall, um, depending on where the properties were located, but from January through to March, um, the Tweed Valley received in the vicinity of um, a thousand millimetres, so you know a lot of you know very heavy rain after the um, 2019 dry, very dry season. Again, initially a few um, of the reports really came in as you know, even though the, the properties had been looked after, you know, destocked fairly early on in the drought, so there was a, a reasonable body of, of feed remaining, a huge rainfall event, um, the grasses just weren't responding um, how people had expected them to, or they were seeing, you know, um, grasses beginning to grow and respond to that rainfall, um, discolouring, dying, and then the only thing people noticed um, remaining or seeming to survive in those areas were a lot of broadleaf uh, weeds and or legume species. Um, so again, it's really been since March 2020 that we've had the uh, uh, official um, identification and, and reports of pasture dieback in New South Wales. If we have a look at that now, what's pasture dieback looking like? Um, for many of you who may not be familiar, you can see a, a screen with a lot of the red splattering or red red dots across it. Uh, Byron Bay is down in the, the bottom right hand corner. So basically, again, majority of these dots at this point in time or, or affected uh, properties are in and around the, the Tweed Valley region. You can see in the Woolambar sort of a bit to the right of the centre of the screen, up towards the Queensland border. There are also two um, more recent diagnoses um, in October, out near the Kyogle or in the Kyogle Shire, just north of Kyogle. Um, again, when we talk about pasture dieback and the, the, the type of country we're commonly seeing it in, um, not too dissimilar to areas of that um, Tweed Valley and the Woolambar. Uh, just last Monday, a colleague of mine uh, confirmed pasture dieback just north of Mullumbimby, which is, I guess you could say now, our most southern um, known or affected property. And again, just want to reiterate, even though pasture dieback is identified or confirmed in both the Tweed Valley and Kyogle Shire, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single property is going to be affected. And another thing I'd like to say about pasture dieback is that in some cases, some of these locations you can see here aren't in fact uh, farmers holdings or properties, some of these are you know, sides of road or crown land areas as well. So pasture dieback, whilst it's a impact to farmers, um, 
which we'll talk through later, it doesn't really discriminate. It's a condition affecting any of those tropical grass growing areas. So not all of these locations are, I guess you could say, properties. A lot are also crown land or, or public land areas. So how do we identify pasture dieback? Typically, the most common thing people will first notice is a yellowing, reddening or bronzing, even through to a purple discoloration of the oldest leaves of a tropical grass plant. Different species will present with slightly different discoloration, but generally that yellowing, reddening through to a purpling, starting of the oldest leaves, running from the tip all the way down toward the, the sheath, which is where the, the leaf joins the stem of the plant, right down into the crown. The other thing, the plants will, or the affected areas, uh, will appear very uh, weak or sickly. Um, you could almost think of it, if you've ever seen a, a slightly oversprayed area or a little bit of spray drift, that chlorotic discoloration, just sick looking plants. Um, when you walk up to these um, plants and begin to get down and dig around them. Um, the other thing you'll notice is the, the root system is significantly impacted. There's you know not a lot of expansion of roots. Um, the picture you can see there is, and it's not doing it justice, that was a very substantial, well-established ceteria plant um, about the size of a, a dinner plate um, that you can see the discoloration, not a lot of green leaf material left remaining there, but it was able to be pulled out single-handedly with minimal effort. Um, following that, the area in and around um, that's been affected with dieback um, basically becomes grey and very, um, or it disintegrates, almost like ash, I, I explain it. Um, when you pick up the dead plant material, you can crumble it in your hands and it um, almost feels like ash. It's really lost all its um, structural integrity. So. Obviously, to anyone watching that, um, with reasonable um, agronomy knowledge, will say, well, you know, there are a lot of other things that can cause those symptoms. Um, so, how do we distinguish between those and and pasture dieback? And we'll talk about that shortly. So, again, leaf symptoms alone um, can be quite confusing. So, we just touched on that discoloration of the plant leaves being the, the first primary indicator. You know, general pasture rundown, we see that commonly on the north coast. Um, basically what we mean by that is, I guess, you know, a tie up or, or a loss of soil fertility um, over time where the grasses just appear, you know, discoloured, slow growing, slow growing, sorry, and quite, quite weak. Um, typically with pasture rundown, you'll, you know, it's seen over the whole paddock. Um, you may notice areas with, you know, dung pats or, or cattle camps. The grasses, you know, won't be as discoloured. They'll be generally quite a bright green. Um, so, and the other thing I guess with pasture rundown is we don't typically see large dead areas, uh, as in total death or loss of grass. We may see a change of species as in, you know, your roads grass may have died out or, or reduced in population and there might be a bit more cooch or carpet grass or something like that sneaking in. Um, you won't see that with dieback, unfortunately. You'll see large dead areas. Uh, moisture stress or temperature stress are other things that can present similar visual symptoms in the leaves of tropical grasses. Obviously, you know, prolonged wet um, or as we're starting to see on the coast a bit now, um, a little bit too dry. Again, the plants are just appearing, appearing quite stressed. But um, typically, you'll see that over a, you know, in as far as distinguishing between pasture dieback and moisture or temperature stress, um, pasture dieback will tend to see it starting in small, smaller patches. Obviously, temperature, moisture, stress will be affecting significantly large areas. Um, Nutrient deficiency, obviously phosphorus deficiency, we can see um, the purple discoloration present in some leaves. Um, nitrogen, we can see some yellow um, discoloration, um, aluminium toxicity. Now, a lot of our north coast soils are significantly acidic. Um, 
for anyone interested, you know, if we're talking pH, often we've got a lot of country pH and calcium chloride down in the, the four to fives. Aluminium um, is relatively high in a lot of our soils as well, um, you know, exceeding 30, 40, 50% in some cases. So again, sensitive species in those situations can present with similar discoloration. If we're talking about Kaikuyu specifically, which there are still significant areas of on the north coast, um, Kaikuyu yellows and black spot, they're both very common and known fungal diseases of um, Kaikuyu on the north coast. So again, basically when we're talking pasture dieback, we go through a process of eliminating all of these type, these more common um, factors to determine, well, are any of these involved or or implicated in why this pasture may be presenting how it is. If not, we're starting to definitely trend more towards uh, pasture dieback. One other thing that is quite common is our common armyworm. Now that's typical generally in our grass pastures here on the north coast from February to May. The difference between that and pasture dieback is obviously common armyworms feed on the grass, you'll see the loss of leaf material, not so much a discoloration. How fast can it spread? Look, it really depends on the growing conditions. Um, now, we talked about it being a condition that affects our tropical grasses. What that means is, unfortunately, conditions that seem to favour the spread of, of pasture dieback are those that coincide with ideal weather for tropical grass growth, that being our warm, humid months following adequate rainfall. In those situations, we can see pasture dieback move up to hectares a week, um, starting from you know, 10, 20 square metres. Um, as we move through to our dry or cooler months of the year, as we've just been through winter, spring, um, a lot of people notice that the, the patches affected by dieback were, you know, the spread was fairly slow, only a couple of centimetres a week in those situations. One thing that we will, I will also say is it's also those high pasture biomass areas or basically paddocks with a good body of feed or areas with a good body of feed such as the sides of road where we typically see dieback really spread more rapidly. Um, this is a picture here of a property down around Dune Dune in the Tweed Valley. The grass there was broadleaf paspalum um, and you can really see that discoloured spread um, right the way um, down towards the cattle and where they're camped there. Um, that property, it was one that unfortunately was watching hectares disappear each week um, through autumn into winter, through winter and spring, it really sort of slowed down. It still is um, prevalent, but the rate of progression has slowed substantially. Um, if we get some good rainfall, I would dare say that we'll see those higher biomass areas really start to um, take off and spread more rapidly again. Species affected, look, this is just a, a list re reiterating that virtually any um, tropical or C4 growing grass, or most of our really common ones, um, have either been diagnosed in Queensland or also here on the north coast. Um, you can see again in that photo there, the, the chlorotic or very sick looking um, plants moving in towards some rose grass there in the background, but you can begin to see bits of cotton bush and broadleaf weed invasion um, with no other grass there. Now, as I said, this is a bit of a, a general list um, running through sort of, you know, any of our tropical grasses that can be affected. But if we have a look specifically at um, New South Wales, the main grasses we've seen affected so far. Now, as you can see here, broadleaf paspalum or paspalum mandiocanum or wetsenii depends on um, what you may know it um, here as locally. You can see the first image there. Typical healthy broadleaf paspalum, nice bright green, photo on the right, that symptomatic plant um, beginning to succumb to dieback. Next most common grass we've seen it in is barhir grass, believe it or not, yes, paspalum notatum. Um, it has, as you can see there in the photo, 
healthy bar here on the left to the very symptomatic, sick, unhappy looking bar here grass on the right. Um, third one being a giant paspalum, paspalum uvelli. Now again, people say, oh, you know, based on the properties we've attended so far and seen, these grasses have been, um, I guess you could say, probably the most dominant species in these areas. So I wouldn't say at this point in time these are the most likely or the only grasses. It's just on the properties affected, these have been the, the first to show symptoms and, prog and progress through to death. Now the fact that they're all in the Paspalum family is um, very interesting. Um, if you ask me to say, well, you know, why could that be? Typically these grasses, broadleaf paspalum especially, is um, very shade tolerant, often lives in and around um, cattle camp areas. It isn't overly pal palatable to cattle either, which, um, as we said earlier, the dieback condition appears to spread more rapidly um, through high biomass areas. Even with you know broadleaf paspalum and a bit of bar here grass, giant paspalum in and amongst other pasture stands, being say Rhodes grass um, or Soteria or Kaiku, for example, cattle will go and select those other grasses more favourably and tend to graze them more heavily than these other grasses listed here. So potentially. Um, Maybe that's a bit of a reason why these less palatable type grasses show symptoms um, a lot more aggressively. Um, it's something that, you know, yeah, there's obviously a susceptibility issue or maybe practically that biomass relationship um, to consider. Other grasses we've seen um, pasture die back in. There's Soteria there. Um, you can see Soteria standing in the background in that taller photo. Again, when you look, and it's a bit hard to see, I, I appreciate in the slides, but very healthy, tall Soteria in the background. That's, you know, pushing three and a half to four foot tall. Quite a high biomass. There's a lot of material in the background there. And you can see that um, just dieback progression working its way through. We've also seen it in rose grass, um, and then, as it touched on others, that we've uh, also seen it in cooch, kaiku, carpet grass, and so forth. Now, I just want to highlight with Soteria there, we, we've got the cultivar, you know, Kazangula, an older variety of Soteria. That was just by chance that that particular property, um, in ongoing ownership, knew for a fact that they had planted Kazangula there. Um, likewise, the property that had um, the Catambora roads, um, they knew that it was Catambora that they had planted there. I certainly wouldn't say that the other varieties of Soteria or roads grass are by any means um, safer or, or more resistant or anything like that. Um, we've seen it in other properties in a whole array of cultivars of both Soteria and roads grass. Um, that being said, Soteria has appeared to be the one of the last grasses to show um, symptoms and, and succumb to dieback. So what I mean by that is where we've seen you know large areas with broadleaf paspalum or bahir grass mixed in to in the pasture um, with Soteria roads, often all of those paspalum species, the bahir, broadleaf, etc., have died and then we see the progression of symptoms and death start through the Soteria roads grass. Um, it's, it's interesting and whether it's um, that touches on a bit, you know, is a more diverse pasture more resistant? Well look, it's probably a little bit hard to say on purely that grass basis but I would suggest that it's more the susceptibility of different grasses and the rate of progression through, through to death that um, appears to suggest that you know a more diverse grass pasture is more resistant. Um, they unfortunately have all progressed through to death. But here, grass has been an interesting one. It has you know on affected properties has um, begun to show signs of it's going to try and come back this growing season. However, we're probably going to need a bit more rainfall yet to see um, whether that actually 
occurs and occurs rather successfully. But anyone who knows anything about Bahi grass, you will certainly know that it, it is an incredibly tough grass and um, a very substantial root system. So it's not surprising that it potentially could be one of the, the first to, to come back. Um, but again, I will talk more about um, the ability or return to a tropical grass later. So what is the cause of pasture dieback? Um, look, it's as of right now, there's you know been a lot of research in Queensland by various universities and Queensland DPI, etc., and um, also in a bit now in New South Wales, but it's not caused by any single agent. So what we mean by that is, if you're in it, you know, farmers want to say what is the the cause? What's causing all my grass to die? Unfortunately, at the moment, we haven't been able to isolate it down to a particular insect or a particular virus or um, pathogen that could be killing the grass. More likely, we would say that, and I feel in, in seeing a number of these sites now, it's certainly a, a bit of a complex or an, an interaction of maybe multiple factors at play and um, under certain circumstances, things line up and the grass eventually says, right, I just I can't sustain anymore and and over it goes. There is substantial research, there's too much to be honest to list here in a presentation between Queensland um, and and soon New South Wales looking at, you know, the identifying causal agents and um, you know, a lot of that work is is really continuing. Um, to anyone that may be on here that's uh, we've been and sampled their properties um, you know as we've talked through we've sent soil plants any insect pests we've been able to find from these properties and, and sick dieback areas through to pathologists entomologists and look there's been you know some lists of varying degrees of different fungal or, or, or viral pathogens return to us but you know nothing has been consistent enough to be able to say that you know just because um, this particular fungus or virus is there um, that's why the grass is dying or basically that's you know there's none of those viruses or funguses have been at a level which would cause death alone potentially with something else you know maybe the grass is unable to resist it there are two insect pests under investigation for their association with pasture dieback. Uh, pasture mealybug, um, Heliococcus somervillii, and also white ground pearl. Now, in New South Wales, look, at the moment, it, it's every sampled site we've had so far. We have found pasture mealybug, and I'll talk about those shortly. Haven't found any ground pearls at this point in time, but they um, are something that's under investigation in Queensland as they have been found there. So pasture mealybug, um, as you can see in the picture there, that's a, a ceteria plant. You can see if you look very closely the underside of the leaf, um, there's quite a number of these little white um, scale-like insects there. You, you see them, um, the zoomed in photo there um, on, the, on the right. Important thing I'll say to any farmers here, these insects you're not going to see from the, the ute as you drive past. Um, these insects, to, to find them, they're incredibly small. It's really a case if you've got to get off the quad bike or horse or whatever and get down in amongst the pasture and really have a good close look um, in and around the, the crown of the plant, down to the soil surface, under any thatch that may be there. Now. Just because we're finding pasture mealybug on all of these properties, and I appreciate the frustration for any landholders there. You know, you've got a large area of your pasture beginning to die. Walk into these dieback areas here in New South Wales, and right at that symptomatic line, or the dieback line as I call it, where the plants are yellowing, purpling, beginning to die, and we find these um, mealybugs. Logic says, let's jump and point the finger on them because as we begin to progress out, that is, you know, toward the, the other appearing healthy pasture that looks, you know, very bright green as, as you'd expect relative to the season, 
very hard to find any. You know, most of these mealy bugs that we find are concentrated in and around that dieback line. Maybe, you know, four to six metres out, there's still substantial population. Once we start to get, you know, 50 odd metres away from that dieback line, um, very hard to find any of them in the paddock uh, with the naked eye. Now, I believe there is work going on looking at, you know, transects um, to, you know, with little vacuum um, harvesters in Queensland to try and, you know, get a better idea of, you know, mealybug populations. But I just want to say that for the time being, we definitely are finding pasture mealybug. I'd, I'd rather say they're associated with pasture dieback areas. And if we think about what I touched on before, with no single causal agent being identified, you know, is it that complex of, you know, potentially maybe we've got a bit of pasture run down over, you know, the last 10, 20 odd years or whatever. Um, we then have maybe a bit of fusarium or something like that come in through the through the pasture sward and then we have mealy bugs land on top of it. We've got a plant that's, you know, right near its wits end of being able to resist something. Unfortunately these three things combine in that, that example there and the grass dies. Um, mealy bugs are uh, what we say uh, sap suckers. They feed on the phloem tissue basically of the grass. Therefore, you know, is it a case of, you know, these mealybugs are transferring an infection or is it the case that, you know, the mealybugs are there and just through their feeding habit they're, you know, when they get to a high enough population over the grass goes? Or the other thing is, I suppose, are the mealybugs there because that grass is sick? So look, there is a lot of work going on in regards to pasture mealybug given its heavy association with dieback areas. Um, however, right at the moment we aren't saying that they're the true cause, as in if you've got pasture mealybug, you've got dieback um, by any means. Actions to minimise the spread. There's obviously, obviously our good farm biosecurity, that come clean, go clean, but um, more specifically, if we're talking about pasture dieback, uh, treat anything that could move uh, dieback affected plant material as a means of spread. You know, slashes, mulches, balers, anything like that. Um, and what we mean is obviously affected tropical grass material. If you know anything that could move it to an otherwise unaffected area, potentially could be a spread. We've just talked about it's very hard with no true single causal agent being identified, it's very hard to say, well, what exactly are you looking to stop the transfer of? But, you know, practically for the time being, anything that could move dieback affected plant material, um, definitely consider it could be a, a means of spread. So obviously, um, hay and silage, you know, where's it coming from? Um, you know, it is beginning to get quite dry on the north coast here. So, you know, for any producers considering potentially buying hay, or silage in, um, I'd strongly suggest you do your homework and find out where it, where is it coming from. Um, there's also, of course, the risk of you know affected um, material blowing off trucks, etc., as as it's being transported around the countryside. One thing I will say is um, it's unclear at the moment if haze or, or silage um, that have been grown in a dieback affected area could could potentially transport the condition. So what I mean by that is, and we'll talk about this later, but a common way some producers have managed pasture dieback is, you know, they've grown a forage crop of, of for example, oats, or they may have grown lucerne or something that can actually grow in the in a dieback affected area but doesn't succumb to dieback itself. They've potentially grown it, cut it for hay or silage, and then, you know, sold it on from there. Um, it's you know, that process of hay or silage making, um, depending on what trash or if there's any affected dieback material remaining there, whether it could have been picked up. Um, so again, I'd just strongly say that anyone considering buying hay or silage, um, do your homework, ask for a vendor declaration, just um, a few quick questions to see where it's possibly coming from. Is there any history of pasture dieback there? And um, by all means, treat it appropriately. 
Um, so again, I, I will just mention people have said, okay, so on the north coast, you first had dieback start in the Tweed Valley, you've now got it, you know, spreading sort of further south to that Mullumbimby area and also out to the Kyogre region. From the affected properties that we know of, there's been no pattern or consistency in the movement of livestock. You know, it hasn't been a producer that's got multiple properties and they've shipped cattle from one place to another or they haven't moved slashes or hay or um, nothing like that. So um, I guess the real big message there to any producers here, if you've got livestock, uh, cattle in particular, there doesn't appear to be any consistency or any way that they are seemingly spreading pasture dieback, even within properties that are affected. Some properties have pasture dieback in a certain area, but um, it's, you know, as cattle have moved around, there's other areas of the property where there is no dieback. So it doesn't appear that livestock will spread pasture dieback by any means. And a really important point I want to bring up here, as we touched on earlier, pasture dieback is most severe in a high biomass area, one of the best, um, I guess, management strategies producers have adopted to slow the spread is actually been by grazing the paddock relatively hard. So they, they've noticed dieback start in a particular corner or, or area. They've gone and then bought the cattle in to graze that paddock as hard as they um, can, obviously accounting for animal welfare and the like. But the cattle will avoid those sick looking plants, certainly. You're more looking to remove the biomass ahead of the cattle, um, or ahead of the dieback, should I say. Um, the other thing, to give you an idea of how extreme that is, there's a couple of properties in the Tweed where they've lost entire paddocks and it's stopped alongside their driveway where they've got a zero turn mower strip either side. Um, that grass is still green, but you know where it was out in the paddocks, um, completely gone. So um, livestock potentially can be a bit of a tool. It's not going to stop necessarily dieback as such, but certainly can help slow the spread uh, across a property. So it comes around to people always want to know how do I treat or control pasture dieback? As we've touched on today, my go-to question back to the producer in that case is, well, what exactly are you wanting to control? I, I understand you, you don't want dieback to spread across your property, but without there being a truly identified cause, it's very hard to put exact steps in place to control pasture dieback. If you are someone that are of the opinion, and there's a lot out there that they want to control the mealybugs, as we've talked through, well, there is a permit in New South Wales to use the product known as Mavento. There is also a fact sheet available on New South Wales Department of Primary Industries website that talks specifically about controlling pasture mealybug in grass pastures. Biggest thing I'll say with anyone thinking that they may wish to control mealybugs, mealybugs can spend part of their life cycle underground very hard to apply chemical to anything that's underground. Second of all, of the chemicals we've got available, they're not exactly um, nice or kind, meaning any beneficial insects, and there are a few that will actually feed. There's a ladybird and a wasp um, that we've also found in association with these dieback areas, they will feed on the mealybugs. If we step down a full-blown chemical control path, um, you are unfortunately going to knock a lot of those beneficial insects out. So um, there is an option there. The other thing people have tried, again, we'll need more rainfall to see how that's going to play out this year, but um, have tried spraying a barrier that is about that 50 metres out in front of the dieback line. Practically with that, you really need to be quite certain that there are no other patches of dieback ahead of that so-called barrier line you've sprayed um, because obviously you can go to the effort spray a bit of a 50 metre buffer but if there's patches of dieback further ahead in that paddock that you haven't seen um, potentially it's still going to spread so again there there is information available for those if you're of the opinion you definitely want to control mealybugs however I couldn't 
hang my hat and say that just by controlling mealy bugs at this point you're not going to see a progression of dieback. Um, removing pasture biomass is probably more likely to, to slow your your progression of dieback down. Um, I'd rather say to people, well, how am I going to manage with pasture dieback? Um, biggest thing I'll say, there is no one-size-fits-all approach with this, and hopefully that's become a little bit clear given the complexity around well, what is the true cause. It's, it's really hard to control something that doesn't yet have a, a identified cause. Why I like to use the term, how am I going to manage with pasture dieback? Again, historically, we've seen producers in Queensland go on to manage quite successfully with dieback. Um, I'm not saying that it's easy and unfortunately there is always potentially a financial cost to the producer which is unfortunate. In some cases, and we'll look shortly there, there are also potentially some opportunities. Um, I guess from the livestock owner or the cattle producer's perspective, what I've got listed on this slide are the, you know, the logical standard farmer responses, you know, if I've got dieback, do I do nothing? Well, we'll talk about this in a second, but it, it's not really a decision with livestock, given on the north coast we're tropical grass dominant, um, pasture base and grass makes up obviously um, cattle's feed. So doing nothing isn't exactly a, a decision. Um, obviously you can move livestock and wait it out, try growing feed, hand feed. Do we sell some livestock and hand feed the balance, um, or, or in some cases, do we consider selling all the all the livestock? Given they are some fairly confronting decisions um, that landholders face, and what makes it even more challenging um, than in the case of, say, a drought or something like that is, as we touched on, just because dieback's in a region doesn't mean every farm's got it. And some of the most challenging conversations I've had with producers are those where they're heavily impacted but a neighbouring property across the road or across a creek isn't and they've got nice beautiful healthy grass yet they're talking 70-80% completely wiped out. So what I've sort of put up here is a bit of a decision making process and I must acknowledge this uh, concept came from Cam Nicholson um, and some decision making um, workshops that he'd run down in the mixed farming system. I adapted it a lot in the drought and now I've just continued to adapt it for pasture dieback. But essentially what we're looking at here is the first most common decision someone with livestock wants to do is, well, what am I going to do with my cattle? Down the left-hand column, I've got what I call the critical considerations. So when we're talking about pasture dieback, you know, what area of the farm is affected? Do you have access to lease or adjustment country or, or potentially another property, um, as many do in that Tweed Valley area? Um, the current market price for cattle on hand, um, what's your capacity and willingness to hand feed? And, and we're talking about finances, machinery, all of those things there. Um, capacity and willingness to grow feed. Um, so again, is your country potentially arable, financial, uh, finances, access to machinery or contractors? And then the anticipated market price for cattle in, in 12, mate, 12 months time. People say, well, why have you put 12 months time there? Um, if, for example, you were one of the properties that um, had dieback move through quite substantially in the autumn just gone, um, you've potentially already just gone through winter spring with very limited to no feed in some cases and potentially you're now starting to, in the, our, the next summer growing season with very limited to no feed. So before you know it, potentially it's unfortunately been 12 months with a very reduced to no feed base. Um, the next column is um, conditions that will change my mind. Now this is designed to be read by the individual producer um, or help step through with, with their advisor. But basically what happens is as we go through thinking of these critical considerations and then at what point will you consider changing your mind or, or do you consider it either too risky or you're not, not comfortable, um, you work across and you develop a score. So if, for example, we say area of the farm affected um, greater, than greater than 
Um, in that case, we've landed with a score of zero. We work through these questions. The next one, producer says, well, you know, is there any lease or adjustment country around? They've said, no, nah, it's impossible. They can't find anything that suits. So still sitting at zero. Um, current market price record, it's the best they've seen. Four points there. Continue on. Um, what's the capacity and willingness to hand feed? You might say, yes, I've got all the equipment and the costs are acceptable based on your current financial situation. Um, in that case, there's a three. If you say that you, you know, you're not comfortable with hand feeding, well, you, you would end up with a zero. We work through the remainder of these, and basically, it lands us with a score. And ultimately, what happens is, depending where you land with a score, we end up with that, what I say, that informed decision. Now, in that case there, that I just talked through, we ended up with that uh, score of about. Uh, nine, I think it was, which was basically, um, no, sorry, ended up with um, in between the 16 and 11. So sell some cattle or hand feed and grow feed. But basically, depending on the score you've ended up with, it lets you then decide, well, you know, what am I going to do? And I've taken the time to accurately assess for my property where I'm sitting and what I'm comfortable to progress through. If you've ended up with a score in that case by how they're weighted less than 11, it's probably suggesting that you should consider selling all your cattle. And that takes into account, basically, you're not prepared to potentially or can't hand feed. You don't have the country suitable to try and grow feed. Um, the other side of that is some people may step through that and find that, well, I'm sitting at 16. Um, so in that case, potentially, they not a large area of their property affected or they're comfortable to hand feed or um, potentially even grow feed. So what that said is, well, they'll keep all their cattle, not going to worry too much, but they will reassess um, their, their decision going forward. Again, it's just a bit of an example um, and just a bit of a way to try and help producers step through that decision making because it is quite confronting when you're standing there with, I guess you could say, a drought in perfect conditions neighbouring properties or other areas may have huge bodies of feed and look quite productive still, yet you're heavily impacted. Um, it's just something that helps producers, you know, with that decision making. And then obviously, depending on where you've landed, if you land at the, the point of you're considering ham feeding or going to grow feed, well, there's other similar tables to step through as determining what proportion of the property or what proportion of the herd would you consider feeding um, to try and put as much information around that decision as possible. For those, um, and it's important to touch on, considering growing feed, um, so basically I guess the key thing with this is the more arable, that is the more I guess you can get machinery across your property, it's potentially easier to manage pasture dieback through growing alternative forages. Um, and in some cases, this potentially can even be an opportunity for properties on the north coast. And what I mean by an opportunity is, if you're a property that's lost, you know, broadleaf, paspale, and bar here grass, for example, um, potentially that's an ideal opportunity to begin to improve the pasture composition that was that is there. Um, starting obviously with you know anything that is a legume or a herb. For example, we've got our tropical legumes all listed there, creeping vigna, glycine, wincassia, um, all those examples of perennial legumes. Um, we've got you know, annual cowpea, soybeans in some cases, herbs such as chicory, leafy turnip, brassica. Um, again, you know, being able to get some of these, particularly the perennials established um, in some of these areas, certainly is only going to have longer term benefits. Um, as far as improved pasture quality or, or diet quality. Um, through the winter period, um, a lot of our C3 or, or temperate um, species have been and were grown very successfully um, being planted directly into dieback areas, particularly oats and ryegrass. Um, they were sown and that was a strategy that a lot of producers took to get through the winter and um, reasonably well into spring. Um, 
So I guess, again, there's winter foragers, clovers, um, vetch, other options for summer, um, you know, summer foragers, millet, forage sorghum and, and corn potentially. The reason I've got asterisks listed against um, a few of these here is, I guess, it's, you know, been very early days and there was a bit of an unknown feeling as to how they would persist in a dieback area, but can definitely say from what we've seen so far in the Tweed Valley that, you know, oats, ryegrass and barley in some cases were um, quite successful options. They grew being directly planted into dieback areas and they grew as well as um, the, the soil fertility and, and farmers' budgets allowed. Um, so again, there is, is that potential to grow feed. The one thing I would say with this is it's definitely not a ticket to, just because I've got dieback, I'll blatantly disregard um, base ag agronomic principles. And what I mean by that is if your soil type, um, for example, isn't um, suitable for a particular species or crop, well, it's not going to magically grow. So you still need to take the time to, you know, consider soil testing, um, base agronomy and suitability of any of these options for your location. Um, but they're all definitely examples of things that um, will grow in the right in dieback affected areas. Um, there is a lot of work going on or moving forward um, in in the research space to try and determine, you know, is there a resistant grass or tropical grass or anything like that, but that work is, you know, underway and is a little way off yet. So the big thing, I guess, is everyone wants to know, well, when can I or should I replant a tropical grass? Unfortunately, at the moment, that's not 100% clear. Um, Queensland experience from both, you know, research work and, and producer um, experience that pastures could simply recover from the seed bank. That is, you know, all the parent plants may have died out, but the following growing season with substantial rainfall, um, grasses have returned from the seed bank. And they've gone on to grow quite well, healthily, and, you know, people have thought, gee, that was, you know, a horrid, horrid growing season when we were affected by dieback, but it's, it's all been fine since. There are unfortunately cases where that has happened. The, the pastures have returned from the soil seed bank and dieback has then again moved through at, at varying degrees of growth stage, which that then leads on to, um, again, for those who have replanted, same things have been experienced. Um, grasses have grown and, and gone on to grow relatively successfully the following season. In other situations, they've grown, got to varying um, growth stages and unfortunately succumb again. So I guess at the moment the general rule of thumb I would say is ideally don't plant tropical grasses alone into a dieback area. If you can wait at least 12 months and change the grass species. So what we mean by that is if for example say you lost a large area of rhodes grass or creeping bluegrass or something like that or broadleaf paspalum, you may consider replanting with ceteria or um, so changing that tropical grass species um, has appeared to work relatively well in, in some cases in, in Queensland but probably the most important aspect of it is look to include a broadleaf species such as a, a legume or herb or something along those lines that even if the grass does unfortunately succumb to die back again, at least you're going to maintain some ground cover and uh, a bit of a feed base in, in that area. So on the north coast, um, we do have a demonstration site in the Tweed Valley. Um, we've looked at both a, a direct drilled and a broadcast establishment of 10 different tropical grasses, nine different broadleaf options. Um, they're all sown individually and in combination to, I guess, try and get a little bit of local evidence um, along the guidelines of what, you know, has been experienced in Queensland, but to try and, um, I guess, you know, further demonstrate um, that, you know, return to tropical grass and um, potentially the opportunity to improve um, some of the pasture species or feed base options in, in those areas. So 
Um, the biggest thing, yeah, definitely don't go straight back in with the tropical grass of the same species um, this first year, despite how tempting it may be in the quest to get feed. How to keep up to date and report pasture dieback? Obviously, you can um, call, email North Coast Local Land Services, follow our social media pages, um, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, um, with, have a pasture dieback page. Um, North Coast Local Land Services website with any links to other dieback information. MLA have a pasture dieback hub which you can find um, just by googling MLA pasture dieback hub. If you're in New South Wales um, you can please report it to our exotic plant pest hotline on the number there. Um, there's also an email address. The big thing I will say is it's not something that producers are quarantined for or, or anything like that in our region. Um, the reason we just want to get a bit of a handle on potentially how quick or how widespread dieback is in New South Wales. Um, so yeah, we'd appreciate people letting us know um, if they suspect that they've got dieback. And um, yeah, I'd like to thank you all for listening and we might shift over to see if there's any questions. All right, thanks Nathan for that, um, informative as always. Um, I'm James Geary and I, I'm an agronomist on the coast with Nathan here. Um, anyway, so question time. So if anyone's got any questions, just pop it into the chat box below. Um, I guess we'll start with, with Sharon's question. Um, Sharon's asked if there's been any research into the numbers of varieties of grass hitting only areas or only hitting areas of one type of grass. So um, I guess Sharon is asking, uh, she's wondering if there have been paddocks with multiple species are less affected than paddocks with single species. Um, did you want to answer that Nathan or? Yep, thanks like James. So look there's, um, I guess, as from a research point of view, I, I'm not aware of anything in New South Wales specifically as in replicated plots or anything, but um, definitely, you know, if you think, for example, the side of a road um, which may have 10, 12, 15 different tropical grass species present um, just growing there, and we've seen, certainly seen them all succumb to pasture dieback. Now, the, probably the thing I would say is um, I wouldn't say that a, a multi-species grass mix pasture is um, any more resistant to pasture dieback. I think it's more the perception. And what I mean by that is there's certain grasses, for example, on the north coast here, Soteria, whilst it is still affected and succumbs to pasture dieback, it seems to resist it the longest for whatever reason that may be. So, you know, there's been cases where we've seen broadleaf paspalum bahir grass, giant paspalum roads grass, creeping bluegrass, enceteria, all coexisting quite happily. They've all succumbed first and there's only been what appears to be like soteria left. Unfortunately, then it's fallen over. That visually, because of the different rate of progression through those different grass species, really um, probably gives that perception that it's not spreading as rapidly as a 100% broadleaf paspalum dominant pasture which can you know really disappear over a matter of weeks in some situations. So yeah I think it's more a perception than um, a, you know that a, a mixed grass pasture persists longer than, than a monoculture. Or resists dieback, should I say? Yeah, I'd agree with you on that one, Nathan. I've recently seen uh, a pasture affected, a pasture dieback affected paddock had kaikuyu, cooch, soteria, uh, rhodes grass, um, and all species were affected. So, um, yeah. Uh, next question. So we've got Susan Pollard. She's asked if weed grasses like blady grass and sporobolus grasses are affected. What do you think Nathan? Yeah look good good question Susan. Um, short answer is definitely. Um, we've seen blady grass affected. Um, 
I've seen Parramatta grass, rat's tail grass, in and amongst, um, you know, rose grass, creeping bluegrass, um, and paspalum again. So again, if thinking back to um, what we touched on, it's it's a condition or, or a complex that affects all our tropical sea fork species, um, and where you see that dieback, there is, you know, quite confronting, but there is literally no tropical grass or grasses left um, as it progresses through. Um, what returns um, in time is, you know, a little bit hard to say at this point for us here in New South Wales. Will it be more of what was originally there? But yes, definitely seen blady grass, um, Parramatta grass, rat's tail, etc. Um, succumb to pasture dieback. So I guess the, the expansion on that in some cases is some producers are a little bit, like dare I say, excited by that. In some cases they are going to try and treat it as a little bit of an opportunity. It's doing a lot of hard work for them um, as in the removal of, um, I guess, weedy type species or, or less productive grass species. However, um, again, it's still managing you know, the fact that the condition will spread through potentially the, the remaining feed base in the paddock. So there's definitely opportunity there. Um, it's just, I guess, how producers are prepared to look at it. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I guess I've got a common question for you that's asked at most of our days. Um, why is it that we see pasture dieback on hills, uh, under trees, and then in creek flats, we see lush, healthy grass or, or floodplains. Um, can you answer that one? Look, it, it, it's a very good question, James. Um, I, I guess this is probably something basing on, you know, trying to overlay a few common um, factors of pasture dieback. And, you know, I, I definitely don't have any hard data around this. But if you think about, again, that pasture biomass, um, that's where we tend to see dieback really at its most vigorous or, or rapid. Um, if we think in under treed areas first and foremost, um, generally regardless of pasture species, you know, livestock camps, that concentration of dung, urine in and around those shaded areas, um, cattle tend to not graze those areas as heavily, um, or there's definitely not that pasture utilisation as as high as other areas of the paddock, so potentially those areas carry a little bit more biomass, um, and but maybe that's you know making the, those areas a little bit more susceptible. In relation to your comment around the hill country, um, again, look on, in the Tweed Valley areas, um, often some of our you know undulating to to steeper areas um, also carry a, a bit more biomass, be it um, from you know blady grass or uh, broadleaf paspalum again. Um, two things there, due to those areas being a bit less arable, there's potentially less um, mechanical intervention, like less slashing, mulching, or I guess less biomass uh, removal. Um, in some areas, you know, the, the cattle, um, you know, w their common water points are down along those creek lines or flats, um, often where more shade is. So, in comparison, those hilled areas versus the creek flats, there's possibly a bit less pasture utilisation on those steeper slopes than down along the, the creek lines um, where, you know, the cattle just in there walk for water and things like that. They tend to more frequently graze those areas. Um, the other thing, I, I guess, if we wanted to step into the realm of, well, you know, mealy bug are definitely associated, um, is it is it because, you know, mealy bugs potentially, you know, aren't as happy in those soil areas that can become a bit waterlogged or, or you know, experience substantially a lot more water um, than those hill slopes could potentially be another theory. But I think if I had to call it overall, I'd say it's probably more aligned to do with um, pasture biomass availability or, or utilisation. Um, we also see a similar thing. There's a number of dairy farms experiencing dieback in their dry runs or the the I guess the non milking platform areas. Now typically dairies have pretty good soil fertility irrigation. They do tend to have higher 
um, pasture or grass utilisation off that milking platform, as in they they rotation rotat rotationally grazed, sorry, more frequently removing a lot more pasture biomass that gets back to a desirable height. It's regrazed down again. Um, I think that definitely something in that utilisation aspect. Thanks, Nathan. Um, is there any more questions? You got any more questions? Just pop them in the box. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pop this over to Nathan. Yeah, thanks, James. And look, thank you to everyone. Um, you will all receive an email in the next day or two with a link to the recording of this webinar and an evaluation survey. We'd, of course, appreciate any of your feedback. Um, and by all means, if you have any more burning um, questions, uh, feel free to um, get in contact with either myself or James Geary um, here at North Coast Local Land Services, and um, we can talk to you further from there.